This video is an account of an incident that happened to me on Thursday the 8th of April. The account will be from two perspectives, mine from the canal water and Peter from the rear deck of narrowboat Bandonian. Let's begin. So, uh, Marianne's accident. Um, what was happening was we were going through the last lock, um, climbing up the flight um, in the Grand Union, up onto the, the Tring summit. Uh, we had been in the lock, the lock had been filled, the gates were open, I was coming out and normally I would come out slowly and as Marianne closed the gate behind me she would then step onto the boat and we would go off. This is always a bit of a balancing act because I was trying to avoid having to go in and tie up so I was trying to hold the boat and hover while she was doing it um, and I don't know if I explained fully to, to Marianne that timing is quite critical in doing this. When I'm working the boat on my own that's how I do it and I'm very conscious of every second when I'm coming out of a lock and closing the gates and making sure that the line, the boat's not going too far, the boat's not going sideways, um, it's not drifting back into the gates and all that sort of thing. As we came out of that gate there was um, a flat concrete um, side to the canal with a water point on it which is in a slightly awkward place um, and there was a boat there although it wasn't taking on water I'm not quite sure why it was there but we also had a wind blowing in from left to right which meant that the boat was being pushed across onto the side um, the side of the, the canal. So as we came out, uh, Marianne was doing what was required, which was to go back to the bottom of, uh, close the gate, go back to the bottom of the lock and open the paddle. Um, the chap in the boat in front of us then said that he was going to go through the lock. So I called to Marianne and she I think closed the paddle but she certainly came back and opened the gate which is a very courteous thing to do um, so that the the boat coming in could go straight in but at the same time the boat was moving forward and it was also drifting sideways and I got to the point where I needed to try to avoid hitting the boat that was on the side um, now in order to get steering, of course, you use the rudder uh, on it, on the narrow boat, like any boat. To get a quick reaction from the rudder, you need to open the throttle because the propeller forces water over the rudder and makes the, and effectively it makes the rudder bigger so that the boat turns more rapidly. So I tried to, I opened the throttle to try to get the boat to swing round so that we didn't hit the boat that was moored. Um, because Marianne kindly was opening the, the lock gate, I had to try to hover a little longer than normal. And, and I did something, and even as I said the words, a part of me th thought, you shouldn't be saying this. I said, can you hurry up? Now that's normally bad thing to do in, in, in any situation. Keep it measured, keep it controlled and if it's not measured and controlled step back and have another go. But Marianne responded to that, stepped onto the side of the boat. I was looking forward and I could see that it was almost certain we were going to hit the boat in front of us so I opened the throttle to try to get the back to come in, which would force the, the bow to go out 
and at least soften the blow on this other boat. At that moment, Marianne slipped and fell into, into the water. Now, my first thought was that it was probably quite shallow and I expected her to, when she fell down, she went down right up to her head and I expected her to then suddenly rise up because she was standing on the bottom. But I've since measured the, the depth there and it was too deep for that. What I became very aware of was that the back of the boat, because I'd blipped the throttle, was moving into the side as the bow was moving away from this boat in front. And uh, I had this horrible vision of Marianne in the water in between this concrete wall and this 16 ton steel boat. And so I pushed the tiller over and tried to use the throttle again to push the back end of the boat away from the side or at least stop it closing so fast. Unfortunately by this point Marianne's legs had gone under the boat and I think that's when she got caught up in the in the propeller. Now part of me knows if there's something in the water that may get caught Put the engine at least in neutral if not turn it off but there was a horrible um, dilemma because the only way i could see to quickly stop the boat from closing in on that concrete wall with marianne in the middle was to use the throttle so um, that's what i did and ever since i've been wondering whether i could have handled that situation better So um, the lesson which I kind of knew before is if things start going wrong, one small uh, mishap doesn't cause a big accident. But what happens so often is one small mishap and then a hurried way, a hurried action to try to overcome that mishap creates two small mishaps which put together make it a big situation. Uh, on a much more minor level that's how I ended up dropping uh, a phone in the canal um, about a year and a half ago. As I say that's a much more trivial thing but in this situation um, I, yeah, I didn't know that the water was at least four feet deep, um, possibly a little more and of course very muddy on the bottom and slippery um, and I, yeah, I didn't know that Marianne would lose her footing on the bottom of the, of the canal. Um, and so what became um, an annoying incident became a very serious incident very rapidly. Um, once that had happened, then it, we, we were just trying to recover the whole situation. So um, Marianne actually gave me some very you know, good information. She said, I need you to free my leg, my clothing from the propeller. So I knew I had to open the hatch. Excuse me. Um, I had to open the hatch and uh, inside the weed hatch, as it's called. So I had to open the rear hatch on the deck um, and then unscrew a big metal cover down below which allowed me to reach down around the propeller and I got a large pair of scissors which I keep in a, um, a tool cabinet right by the engine room uh, and I was able to cut away her clothing so that she could get free but in the meantime she had to just hang on to the back of the boat uh, and of course all that time she was getting colder and colder so I, I guess the one big takeaway, which, as I say, I kind of have said before, but I just need to live it more, is if something starts to go wrong, don't try to fix it. Take a step back. I could have said um, to Marianne, stay on the bank, 
I'll get the boat stabilised and I'll come back for you. Which would have been annoying and time consuming. But with hindsight, it would have been so much better. So that's my thoughts of um, what happened on Thursday. I'm sitting here, as you can see, in hospital gowns. And thankfully, I'm in a single room, so I'm able to do this without disturbing anyone else. Last Thursday, we came through the lock at Cowroast Marina and we'd finished filling it and I'd opened the gate and we were coming through and there was a boater moored up at the water point who said leave it full because he was going to go through. So I thought I'd be helpful and open the gate again. Now normally when, we, when I close the gate Peter has come up to the bank and I just step on the boat and we cruise away. On this occasion it didn't happen that way. I went and opened the gate and Peter had already tried to manoeuvre the boat close to the bank. However, we had some quite strong winds at that point and the front of his boat was going to be making contact with the boat that was moored up by the water point. And I've done this loads of times. I've taken a step onto the boat, walked down the gunwale and pressed against another boat to stop and avoid a collision. On this occasion though, one part of the safety procedure that goes on in my brain whenever I step onto the boat was missing. I normally, when I step on the boat, make sure I've got a good hand grip on the rail before I remove my back foot from the land. And I didn't do that this time. So the result was I reached for the rail, I released my back foot and went sliding down the side of the boat into the canal water, which was freezing. I went under the water and I came up, having swallowed some of the canal. I went under again and I do not open my eyes when I'm underwater, ever. However, necessity meant that I did on this occasion. I saw murky canal water above me. I saw the boat and I saw the silver chain of the back button. I grabbed for that button because I thought I was going to drown. I pulled up on that back button and then my legs swung under the boat and my left leg I'm giving you warning here, you might want to switch off or, or skip ahead. My left leg got tangled up with the propeller and the rudder. And Peter was trying to manoeuvre the boat to disengage me. But it's very difficult when you're on the stern to actually know which way to move the boat in order to disengage somebody's leg from underneath when you don't know where they're trapped and how. So I was in a lot of pain, screaming probably at this point. The boat was drifting towards the bank. There was a stone wall behind me, which was the edge of the bank, just outside the lock. The other boater had come out and was asking me to give me his, uh, my hand. And all I could do was keep myself afloat. I'd been under a couple of other times, or it felt like a couple of other times at that point. So what were my options? Drowning being crushed against the side of the canal wall or mangled by a propeller. None of the options were very good to me at that point. And apart from anything else, I was by this time really, really cold. I did eventually reach my right arm up and David, the man on the moored boat, hung onto my arm. My other arm was hanging on for dear life to the windlass that I'd had there and the chain of the button. And Peter was trying to manoeuvre the boat to decide what to do for the best. Eventually, I managed to mouth the words, turn the engine off, which he did straight away. Now, you'd think that would be the first thing to do. But when you're reacting to a situation like this, it's not necessarily the first thing you do. But when the engine was turned off, the propeller stopped and my leg was hurting like billy -o. 
The rudder was pressed up against my hip. I didn't know which way to move my leg. And then Peter thought about lifting up the weed hatch and seeing what was down there. I could feel the weed hatch with one of my arms actually, uh, one of my hands, and I showed Peter where I was and he was then able to locate my leg and cut away my clothing below because it had all slipped down off my hips, halfway down my legs and to my knees. And he just started cutting away at my leggings and my winter tights that I had on underneath. He managed to get all of that unraveled from me and then I was able to breathe a little bit more easily because there was nothing tugging at my legs anymore. But it took me quite a few minutes to get my breath back and to decide what I was able to do to help them to get me out of the canal. Um, I dropped my windlass, my favourite windlass, one with the twizzly handle. Um, so I'm going to have to try and find another one. <laughs> would you believe it when I was in the water and I dropped my windlass that was my first thought it was my favorite windlass to use it's amazing what goes through your head when you're doing this sort of thing um, and David still had my, my arm and I was still hanging on to the button Peter was cutting away at my clothes and then after that was done he was able to help me disengage my legs my leg from the propeller and my right leg all the time was trying to press against the housing of the propeller, I don't know what that's called, to keep my leg away, to keep my body away from the prop and the rudder as well. I didn't quite succeed in that, but when my leg was released, it was just dangling there, I couldn't move it. My right leg was practically immobile because of all the stress it was under. And I was just hanging there between the button and my arm being pulled upright. There was another man on David's boat and he asked me to give me, uh, to give him my hand, which I did eventually. And then between the two of them, they hauled me up onto the stern of Peter's boat. And I sat there and it was once I was there, I know, knew it was cold, that the shivers kicked in. I couldn't speak, I couldn't move. And I just had this really, really deep cold inside me that had now started hitting me. Um, Peter brought out blankets and um, towels and started wrapping me up. Because by the time I was pulled out and covered in towels and blankets, the ambulance had arrived. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank all my new subscribers in the last two weeks. Thank you so much for subscribing. I really do appreciate it. I want to also thank all my well wishes from the Narrabah and Canal Lovers Facebook page. I appreciate those comments. Thank you so much. I would like to wish you all well. So until next week and next week's video, 